We are today in the second week of our legacy message series. And um, I just want to, before we jump into the word, just pray. I just want to clear the air in the room and pray for God's spirit to speak to us. So join me in prayer. Father, I, I thank you that you've been so good to all of us. Even when we didn't deserve it, you were always good. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to hear your word this morning. And God, right now, in the name of Jesus, I bind any distractions in this room. In the name of Jesus, I bind any kind of warfare going on in this room. In the name of Jesus, help us to hear your word today clearly and then do it. Settle down in this place. Let your presence fall. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> so we'll start here. I love to sing. I do. I love to sing. I, I, and I sing everywhere. I sing in my car when I'm alone. I sing in my car when I'm with people. I sing on stage on Sunday mornings. Perhaps this might be the Sunday where you're fortunate enough to hear Pastor Jason sing. I love to sing. Here's the problem. I can't sing <laughs> at all. Like I, I am as tone deaf as it gets. I can't, I can't stay on pitch. Heck, I can't even find the pitch to begin with. I love to sing, but I cannot sing. Uh, listen, the, the, Bible never, the, the Bible only said to make a joyful noise, right? It didn't say it had to sound pretty. It just said it had to be joyful. Check. And I guess noisy. <laughs> Double check. I love to sing. When, one time my oldest son, he's 17, Jackson, said, Dad, why are you always singing, Dad? It's so embarrassing. And I said, Son, it's because Goinses have a song in their hearts. We're that joyful. That's why we're always singing, and it's true. My dad, my father, who's here this morning, he's always singing, always. And I'm always singing, and, and my three children, they're always singing. Jackson is 17. Now, he's more gangster rapping than singing at this point in his life. I guess that counts. And my, my artistic 14-year-old, Sela, with purple hair, she's more into the grunge kind of music, but, I, but she's always singing in them. My nine-year-old daughter, Eliana, the baby, the spoiled one of the family, she is constantly now singing our kids' Christmas play music that you all are going to hear in a few weeks. I've already heard it a million times. It's going to be great. My kids are always singing, too. Legacy, I guess, is intact. Legacy. Last week, Pastor Jace opened up this series. And did, first of all, didn't, didn't Pastor Jace bring an amazing word last Sunday? Wasn't that amazing? So good. And he defined legacy like this. Pastor Jay said, legacy is what you leave behind and how useful it is to the people you leave behind. I love that. I'd like to add sort of a definition 1B to that. I define legacy like this. Legacy is the song you leave them singing when you're gone. Legacy is the song you leave them singing when you're gone. The title of my message today is simply called this, Leave Them Singing. Leave Them Singing. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Psalm 112 and stand to your feet. And we're going to take a trip to talk about how you can leave your family singing when you're gone. Your kids and your grandkids, your family, what kind of song are you leaving them? I hope it's a joyful song. Psalm 112 says this in verse 1. It says, How joyful everybody say joyful. joyful how joyful are those who fear the lord and delight in obeying his commands their children so so let's let's this is actually in third person this is a, a promise to you this is about your children so everybody say my kids. my kids your kids will be successful everywhere i love that I love reading it like this. My kids will be successful everywhere. On the count of three, can we all just say that together? My kids will be successful everywhere. Let's just claim that over our children and our grandchildren. Is that okay if we bless your family this morning? God promises you on the count of three, one, two, three, that my children will be successful everywhere. And an entire generation of godly people will be blessed. Oh, what promises God has just promised to you and your family. It's not just one promise here. There are multiple promises here. First of all, God promises you joy. Joy unspeakable. 
Joy. Now, there are a lot of reasons for you to have joy, right? If you are saved, there are a lot of reasons for you to have joy. Just to name a few. One, Jesus came for you. You should be joyful. Two, you should be joyful because Jesus died for you. Three, you should be joyful because Jesus was resurrected for you. Four, you should be joyful because Jesus has set you free from your sins. Five, you should be joyful because Jesus has now set you up for an abundant life on this planet. And six, he has also set you up for an abundant afterlife in the sweet by and by. Why are you not clapping? Why are you not joyful? You've got a reason, many reasons to be joyful. But here, there's a specific reason for you to be joyful. We'll put this verse back on the screen for you. Why should I be joyful? How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands? Their children will be successful everywhere. Here, the reason for your joy is traced to the success of your children and your grandchildren, your family. As a parent, and maybe many of you aren't there yet, you will be, so just take my word for it. As a parent, one of the things that makes me most joyful is when somebody tells me that my child is successful. Like when I go to, to the parent-teacher conference, and you know how it is, parents, grandparents, when that teacher comes up to you you've never met before, and they say, your child is such a joy to teach. And you're like, you, you talking to me? My child? Yeah, your child. Wait, let's make sure we're talking about the right person here. The one with the purple hair right now, my child. You talking about, yes, your child is, and, and nothing makes me smile more than knowing that my child, while they're under my roof, is being successful. You parents know what I'm talking about, right? It just makes us smile. It does. But the promise of God to you is that your children won't just be successful while they're under your roof and you're going to parent-teacher conferences. The promise of God to you here is that your children will be successful everywhere. So not just while they're under your roof, but as, as a parent of a graduating senior this year, your child will be successful when they leave your house. Your child will be successful when they have conversations with you, hypothetically, and they say, Dad, I'm turning my location services on my phone off next year. You're not going to be able to know where I'm going like a crazy stalker anymore, anymore Dad. I'm, I'm a man now, Dad. It's time for this to stop, Dad. And I'm like, uh, well, hypothetically, I'd be like, hey, because um, it's hypothetical, right? Uh, uh, who do you think you are, son? I brought you in and I can take you out. See, see, <laughs> hypothetically, <laughs> um, the, the, the promise of God is better than location services on your phone. You, you don't have to, because you stand on the promises of God, you don't have to worry about tracking your kids everywhere they go. God promises you that the next generation will sing your song. God promises you that your children and your grandchildren can leave a legacy. I want to talk to, can, can live your legacy. I want to talk to you today about how the next generation can end up singing your song. Let's see, you have got a multi-generational legacy-making anointing on you. You do. My great-great-grandchildren are not going to know my name. They're not. You don't know your great-great-grandfather's name probably. But despite not knowing my name, I believe, based on this promise, that my great-great-grandchildren are going to be driving home from work one day, and it's been a hard day. And they're just going to start singing. And they're going to be singing a song that I helped to put in their heart. And I believe that for your great-great-grandchildren, too. It's all about legacy. Before you find your way to your seat, high-five a few people and tell them, leave them singing. Leave them singing. Leave your children singing a song. Leave your grandchildren singing a song. What kind of song are you leaving for your family? What are they singing when you left, when you leave? But the promise in Psalm 112 is conditional, right? It's conditional. Go back. We'll put this verse back on the screen for you. Put Psalm 112 verse 1 back up. It says... If you fear me and obey me, then you'll leave a legacy. It's conditional. In the law, 
lawyers will tell you there are two kinds of promises that the law recognizes. There's a conditional contractual promise, but there is also, there's also what, the, what lawyers call a gratuitous promise. A, a gratuitous promise is, I'm just going to give you something, you know? And, and so a gratuitous promise sounds like, sounds like this. Uh, hey, hey, you, three rows back on the end here. I'm just going to give you, I got another Starbucks gift card here. I'm just going to give you, I can't see who you are, but I'm just going to give you this Starbucks gift card, okay? You didn't do nothing to earn it. I'm just going to give it to you. And immediately that brother starts to dream of Starbucks, and their cup sizes that make absolutely no sense in logic whatsoever. Can I get a witness? But it's a gratuitous promise. He didn't have to do anything to earn this. And so legally, I could say, psych, change my mind. And he could sue me, but he would lose because it's a gratuitous promise. He didn't do anything to earn it. Now, morally, you all might say, that pastor's a jerk. I'm leaving his church. Understand, there's a difference between legality and morality. That's something we've lost big time sight of in the world today. Just because it's, just because it's not legal doesn't mean it's not moral. And, and so there's a difference. There's a difference between a gratuitous promise and a contractual conditional promise. Because a contractual conditional promise it requires both sides to do something. And so it sounds like this. Hey, you, three rows back on the end over there. I can't see who you are, but that's okay. If you just stand up, then I will give you this free Starbucks gift card. And, and so it creates obligations on both sides. That, that, that's what makes it a contract, right? And so if he stands up, and whoever you are, if you'll stand up, if you'll stand up and everybody will clap for you, stand up, stand up. See? See? Oh, I see your face now. Okay. I hope you like Starbucks. So the instant he stood up, the instant he stood up, a contract was created. He did his part of the, of the, of the contract, and now it is my legal obligation to perform my side of the contract. And so I've now morally and legally got to give you this Starbucks gift card. So Pastor Jeremy, will you take that to that, bro that brother back there and give him a hand? He just won Starbucks, okay? What God is promising you in Psalm 112 is not gratuitous. It is conditional and it is contractual. It requires you to perform actions first. It requires you to stand up and say, my family will have a legacy. It requires you to fear God and obey God. And God says, if you fear me and if you obey me, then you will leave a legacy. But only then. See, this is the problem in the modern American church is we think with God everything is gratuitous. We have heard so much excessive hyper grace teaching that, that we think God's just going to drop everything into our laps. But it doesn't work that way. Well, what about grace? I thought, I thought grace was free. I thought salvation is unearned. It is. Grace is absolutely gratuitous. Grace is free. There is nothing Absolutely nothing you can do to earn heaven. Heaven has already been earned for you through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Heaven is free. Here's your first message point this morning. Write this down. Grace is gratuitous. Grace is free. But legacy? Legacy will cost you something. Grace is gratuitous. But legacy will cost you something and so psalm 112 is i guess you could consider it a legacy contract it's a contract between god and you i love this idea of a legacy contract so much that i started talking to our vivid youth department and our um and our children's department here about it our glow kids department about it and i said guys i want you to start working on legacy contracts for our parents and grandparents here I want for parents and grandparents to know that if they invest their children in Glow Kids and Vivid Youth, that this is what this church will do. And we're not ready to present that to you yet. 
And it'll be first of the year, but our, our children's and our youth departments are going to present to you parents and grandparents what you will receive for your investment of your children into this church. But just to give you a sneak preview, it's going to, say, it's going to sound something like this. It's going to sound like this. Uh, it, for those of you who invest your children in Glow Kids, by the time they graduate from fifth grade, your children will know the Bible. Your children will know, I don't know, I think 30 key Bible verses sounds good by heart. How many of you know 30 key Bible verses by heart? Your children will have had multiple opportunities to accept Jesus into their hearts by the time they have left fifth grade. Your children will know how to lead other people to Jesus by the time they leave fifth grade. For, for your students, it sounds something like this. By the time your student graduates from high school, your student will have led at least one other person to Jesus. By the time your student graduates high school, uh, your, your student will know how to defend their faith. Be because I am tired of us sending our kids into a world that is trying to indoctrinate our kids. Oh no, when our kids come out of this place, our kids are going to be singing the songs of Jesus when they come out of this place. It's a legacy contract. We'll, we'll finalize that at the first of the year. I just wanted you to get excited about that. That's a project we're working on, along with midweek services that are going to come next year, too. Psalm 112 is a legacy contract. It, it is, if you fear me and obey me, then you will leave a legacy. And so your legacy, you've got to sweat for. You've got to earn your legacy. But this is what caught me when I started reading this again. We'll put this verse back on the screen for you. Verse 1 says, if you fear me and obey me, if you do those things, you'll be joyful. But then verse 2 says, it says, then your children will just be successful everywhere they go. And when I read that, it's almost like the scripture is saying that what you've got to sweat to get, your children are just going to freely receive. You see that? They've just got to be willing to open up their hands and receive it. And the Lord just hit me with this thought that for you, this is so good, you might want to clap for this, that for you, legacy is earned. But for your kids, your legacy can be free. I cannot tell you the number of times that I have, that I have sat across the table from a person who's an alcoholic, who is an alcoholic a person suffering from alcoholism, and they've said to me over and over again, this stuff is in my family. This is our legacy. They'll say it's over and over, they'll say, it's like the deck was stacked against me. And I thought about that as I was preparing for this message today. And I thought about how the enemy has a counterfeit for everything good that God does. And if the enemy can create a legacy that is stacked against our kids... Just leave it to God to make it so that we can stack the deck in favor of our kids. Yeah. I, I wonder if there are parents and grandparents and soon-to-be parents in the room who want to say, you know what? My babies are going to have the deck stacked for them and not against them if I have anything to do with it. What I've had to sweat to get, my babies are just going to get. My babies aren't going to have to fight the same fights I had to fight if I have anything to do with it. My babies aren't going to make the same mistakes I've made if I have anything to do with it. My babies aren't going to have to climb the same mountain I had to climb. My babies are going to start their adulthood on top of the mountain. And not just on top of the mountain, but they're standing on my shoulders on top of the mountain. What I had to sweat to get, my babies are just going to get. Legacy legacy you've got to earn it but your kids can just receive it if you'll do your part so will you are you doing your part you've got to actually do something your side of the equation of the contract is you must obey the lord and you must fear the lord Leg here's your second message point Legacy is about what you actually do, not what it looks like you do. Legacy is not based on what you want them to see. Legacy is based in reality. 
Anybody can look good on Sunday morning. I find it so interesting, don't you, how we put our best face forward for people we, we spend the least amount of time with. And the people who are the closest to us, who are receiving our legacy, they get our worst side. Don't you find that interesting? We give our best to everybody else, but the people who receive our legacy, they get our worst. That's the flesh. That's what the flesh will have you do. So are you full of legacy or are you full of fake this morning? Legacy is not about you putting your best foot forward and showing the world your your filtered, finely finished photos on Facebook. I mean Facebook. Your, your legacy is about reality. Because if you're full of fake, the people who matter the most, the people who will actually receive your legacy, they know. We don't know, but they know. Your kids know if you're full of fake. Your, your wife, your husband knows your coworkers, your employees know if you're full of fake. Your teammates know if you're full of fake. You want to know, and maybe you wonder, am I full of fake? I don't know. Maybe I am. Here's how you can find out. Seriously, just ask your kids because they will tell you. They've been waiting on this opportunity, trust me. Your kids are the most honest, unfiltered opinion of you that you've got around you. Just ask my kids. I don't know if they're gaslighting me or something, but they're trying to convince me that the inside of my car stinks. Every time they get in my car, Dad, your car stinks. It smells just like you. Every time they get in my car, and I'm like, what is going on here? But your kids can smell fake. The people around you can smell when you're fake. They'll, your kids will walk into the room. The people close to you will walk into the room and see you, and they'll be like, who faked in this room? Who was that? That's funny, y'all. So ask them. I want to finish this morning by telling you the story of Rehoboam. The story of Rehoboam is best summarized in 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings 14, 21 says, Meanwhile, Rehoboam, son of Solomon. So pay attention to that. Rehoboam is the son of the great King Solomon, okay? He was king in Judah, Rehoboam was. When he was 41 years old, Rehoboam becomes king. And Rehoboam reigns 17 years in Jerusalem. During Rehoboam's reign, verse 22 says, the people of Judah did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Watch that. The whole nation does what is evil in the Lord's sight, provoking God's anger with this nation's sin. So yes, God cares about national morality, and God cares about national consciousness. Verse 25 says, In the fifth year of King Rehoboam's reign, King Shishak of Egypt attacked. So Shishak attacks Jerusalem. Shishak attacks Jerusalem, and verse 26 says, He ransacks the treasuries of the Lord's temple. So Shishak attacks and ransacks the temple. <laughs> I work so hard on this message, you all. And the royal palace, he, Shishak, stole everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had, re had made. Remember, Rehoboam is the son of the great King Solomon. King Solomon had had 500 gold shields made that are worth $6 million in today's money. Okay? So he had five, the, these shields are stolen. And King Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, later replaces them, these gold shields, with 500 bronze shields as substitutes. So the gold gets replaced with the bronze. I, I wonder, just a question, are you leaving a gold legacy for your family or a bronze legacy for your family? What, what are you leaving? Solomon, Rehoboam's father, is re widely regarded and scripturally so the wisest man to have ever lived. Can you imagine being the son of that? Maybe some of you can get that. You, you are the son or daughter of greatness, or greatness is in your family, and you carry the weight of that. Not only is Solomon the wisest man to have ever lived, Solomon is also the richest man to have ever lived. Most scholars believe that Solomon is the world's only trillionaire to have ever existed. 
trillionaire. By comparison, the, I checked this morning because it's always changing. The richest man in the world today is Elon Musk, and he is worth about 203, I should say a mere 203 billion. While our guy Solomon is worth over a trillion dollars. Solomon is the richest man, the wisest man to have ever lived. What does he use all of this, th these gifts for? He builds the gold-layered temple of God. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Its value itself was over a trillion dollars. By comparison, the most valuable building in the world today is worth a mere 100 billion dollars. Anybody know what it is? It's the mosque at Mecca. And when I saw that, I thought, you know, that's interesting that the most valuable building in the world today is funded by people worshiping a fake God. And I thought, if, I, this is what I thought, it's just a side, side note. I thought, if, if Muslims can build something like that, a hundred billion dollar building in worship of a fake God, then come Legacy Sunday, we at Renaissance Church who serve the one true God should have no problem raising a hundred thousand dollars to build a 650 seat auditorium about five minutes from here, that's going to change the triad forever. We should be able to do that. If Muslims can do that, we can do this, right? Solomon was a great man. But he was also a fake man. Because great does not preclude you from being fake. He's full of fake. Solomon marries. <laughs> Solomon marries women who, and probably that's his first mistake, he married more than one woman, right? Solomon marries women who worship other gods. And they pull Solomon towards their other gods. Listen, I want you to hear this. Evangelistically marrying somebody never works. It does not. Listen, young adults and students, listen to this. Listen. The most important legacy-defining decision you will ever make besides saying yes to Jesus is the person you choose to marry. He or she will set the course for your legacy. If you do it evangelistically, I hope they get saved someday, you are shooting your legacy in the face. And, and while I'm on this, if marriage is the most, second most important legacy-defining decision you will ever make, then right behind that, students and young adults, is the people are the people that you choose to date. Because we marry who we date. Well, I'm just 15. I can date who I want to. I'm just 15. No! Because at any age when you date, you are creating patterns and pathways and strongholds in your brain for the kind of people that is acceptable for you and that you are attracted to. And so what, what I'm saying is, girlfriend, don't date him because he's fine. Because fine can cover up fake. <laughs> date him. Somebody can tweet that. Date him. Because he's one of the real ones. Date him because of that. Solomon is a fake man. Great man. But he is a fake man. And the next thing we hear is that in the next generation, the entire nation of Israel, the entire nation is doing evil in the Lord's sight. So, what Solomon did behind closed doors in the first generation is now out in the open in the second generation. You see that? This is your third and final message point this morning. It goes like this. The hidden sin and question morality of this generation will become the morality of the next generation. The hidden sin and question morality of this generation will become the normality in the next generation. As I was preparing for this week, the Lord just spoke this to me. The Lord said, Jason, for the last three generations, the spirit of the slippery slope has infected America. Yeah. And so in the 30s and 40s, the greatest generation begats the boomers. And the boomers look at their parents and they slide a little bit. And then the boomers begat the Gen Xers and they slide a little bit. 
and then the Gen Xers begat the millennials and the Gen Zers, and now sin is out and open for the world to see. As a matter of fact, if you're not sinning, there's something wrong with you. But I believe this morning that God is looking for a church. God is looking for a family who says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God is looking, God is looking for men to be men. Men in the room, listen to me. God is looking for you to step up, to stand up, to draw a line in the sand and say, no more slipping for my family. From now on, my family is a God family. My family will sing the songs of Jesus. Men, God calls you to lead, lead. God is looking for preachers who will square their shoulders back and say with confidence, it's right and it's wrong because the Bible says it's right and it's wrong. God is looking for people. A church. Will you be those people? Will you be that church? Will you be a family that, that puts your song into the next generation? You've got to do something. Shishak attacks and ransacks the temple. You'll know whether your family is brass or gold when the attack comes. When the attack comes, the brass comes out. Or the gold stays constant. Solomon builds these 500 shields. Look at my shields, everybody. Never mind what I'm doing behind closed doors. And Rehoboam is left with a bronze legacy. He builds 500 bronze shields. Now, bronze and gold look similar, right? They look the same, but you can tell they're different. First of all, the gold shields are worth more. They're worth $6 million. The bronze shields, I went on to Amazon this morning. You can buy bronze shields for 85 bucks a piece. As your pastor, I implore you, leave a legacy that is actually worth something. The, the gold shields weigh twice as much as the bronze shields weigh. You can tell there's a difference. There's a weight difference. As your pastor, I implore you, leave a legacy that actually weighs something. The gold shields are made of pure metal, pure gold. Bronze is a combination of metals. And so it therefore tarnishes under pressure. And when bronze tarnishes, if you smell it, it stinks. It has an odor. And as any 16-year-old young man can tell you, when you wear a fake gold necklace, it's actually a bronze necklace. When it tarnishes, it turns your neck green. Anybody know what I'm talking about? As your pastor I implore you, I beg you, leave a legacy that will not tarnish under pressure. When Shishak attacks, leave a legacy that will stand up. Leave a legacy that does not have an odor to it. Who faked? Leave, leave a legacy that does not turn people green around you. Leave a gold legacy, not a bronze legacy. I want you to stand, and we're going to finish. What will happen to your family when Shishak attacks? Gold or bronze? I'm sorry to be a downer, but an attack that every one of your families will eventually have to face is your death. You are going to die. And what will you leave behind? Listen, I've done, I pastor a young church, but I've done way too many funerals. And as soon as you walk into the funeral home, you can immediately tell if this is a brass funeral or a gold funeral. You can just feel it. You know, the gold funerals, the best ones, they are the ones, they're the ones where your family, well, yes, they're upset because they lost you. They're crying because they lost you. Tears of sorrow. But I've seen it over and over again. They're also crying tears of joy because of the song you left them singing. Those are the best funerals. I've been to funerals that are more like celebrations than they are like funerals. I, that's the kind of funeral I want. 
a celebration. What will happen when Shishak attacks? One of the most enduring memories of my life is we were all in our living room at my parents' house, and my father finds out that his dad has just died. And I watch as my dad collapses on the floor in tears. Like he's, he's on the floor shaking in tears. I've never even so much as seen this man shed a single tear, much less what I'm seeing in front of me. He is convulsing because of what he's just found out. I don't know what to do. I have no frame of reference for this. And so I remember just walking up to my dad and draping myself over him, and he's shaking. But, but underneath the sobs, is he singing? He was, he was singing. He was, it seems like he's singing. I could, I could hear my dad say, God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. God, you're still on the throne. In the worst moment of his life, my dad was singing. When Shishak attacks, will your family sing your song? What song will they be singing? 